All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Tom Devanowitz. I'm with uh, U.S. Uh, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, Pittsburgh Mining Research Division. And I'll be sharing some in information on thermal runaway pressures of iron phosphate cells within sealed enclosures. And the work has uh, implications for uh, batteries housed within flame-proof or explosion-proof enclosures uh, for use in gassy mines. <clears throat> Okay, it doesn't happen all that often, but uh, every, every now and again, um, you know, lithium ion batteries uh, can catch fire. Um, for example, last year there was uh, an, an, uh, an incident with the uh, energy storage system in uh, Arizona uh, where there was a thermal event and a subsequent explosion that uh, seriously injured uh, four firefighters. Uh, over in South Korea, there were uh, 28 such uh, ESS fires over a period of a few years, and um, those fires represent a fairly high uh, failure rate. <clears throat> and then uh, the U.S. Uh, Consumer Product Safety C Commission uh, recently reported that uh, there have been over 25,000 overheating or fire incidents of all, involving more than 400 types of uh, lithium battery powered consumer products uh, that occurred over a five year period. So um, it's something that may not happen all that often, but it's, it's something that we need to be aware of and prepare, potentially prepare for. Okay, uh, this group is uh, very familiar with the advantages of uh, BEVs. Uh, from, a, from a health standpoint, we're very excited about the prospect of reducing or possibly uh, eliminating uh, emissions from diesel-powered vehicles. A lot of health reasons for that. Uh, but when it comes to um, using these uh, BEVs in, in, in gassy mines, there are some questions about the potential for uh, pressurized explosions uh, involving the, the batteries themselves. So internationally, when we talk about um, large um, pieces of equipment such as battery electric vehicles uh, using gassy mines, uh, they're generally going to be considered what we call category N2 explosion protected equipment. And for this category of equipment, um, you know, the, the protection is good is going to be good for uh, anticipated normal operations and uh, and uh, foreseeable adverse operating conditions. And uh, if uh, a flammable ga uh, gas cloud uh, should occur, uh, you have to shut off the equipment. But in the case of uh, battery powered equipment, uh, the equipment may be shut off, but uh, the battery will probably still be energ energized. And that, uh, that could potentially pose a stranded energy ign uh, ignition risk. And uh, flame proof or explosion proof uh, enclosures are very commonly used with uh, this category of explosion protection. So the idea of a, an explosion proof or flame proof in enclosure is uh, if a flammable gas should get inside the enclosure with uh, electrical equipment that poses an ignition source, uh, should an, uh, uh, an, an ignition occur the explosion will be confined within that enclosure such that you know flame will not uh, propagate out and ignite the uh, surrounding mine atmosphere. And there's just a couple examples of uh, XP or flame proof enclosures. Um, enclosures are typically uh, characterized by how they are sealed. So with the uh, bolted flange joint we have a, a flat surface seal uh, you can have a threaded joint seal and the uh, spigot joint on the right, that's a uh, circular surface uh, seal uh, and it's primarily found with uh, flame proof designs. And design requirements can be found in these documents. Uh, internationally, we'd be looking at the 60079-1 standard uh, for flame proof enclosures. Uh, in the U.S., um, MSHA has their uh, mining regulations in the 30 CFR Part 18. And in North America, uh, for surface locations, uh, uh, they may use the uh, division system, and standard for those enclosures uh, is uh, Underwriters Laboratories uh, 
1203. And if you take a look in, in, in these standards, you'll, you'll find that there are, are not really any uh, specific evalu evaluation criteria that address uh, lithium ion, ion battery thermal runaway. So uh, when looking at the, the uh, design criteria, there are really two pressure values we need to keep in mind. One is how much pressure can the enclosure uh, withstand? And the other value is just how much pressure might you generate within the enclosure? And pressures within the enclosure uh, could vary depending on uh, what kind of gas you have in there or uh, if there's any uh, potential turbulence or pressure piling. Uh, this example I have on the screen is, uh, is from the MSHA regulations. Um, the uh, specifications in the flame proof uh, standard are pretty comparable. <clears throat> uh, the flame proof uh, enclosure standard uses what they what they call a reference pressure, and then there's a safety factor on top of that. But the uh, uh, the pressure values are going to be uh, somewhat similar to what you see here, uh, uh, somewhere around 150 psi uh, for the minimum uh, uh, pressure that the enclosure must withstand. And with methane explosions, um, you shouldn't really see much pressure higher than 125 PSIG. So in our work, um, we wanted to measure the pressure of generated from uh, lithium iron phosphate cells within uh, sealed enclosures. And in our initial work, uh, we did not have any methane air inside of the uh, enclosure. And um, Battery th lithium ion battery thermal runaway may be induced by overheating, uh, such as uh, electrical fault within a large format battery, or inter internal faults within the cells uh, from cells that are susceptible to uh, thermal run uh, runaway from uh, internal short circuit. So what we did was uh, we used a, uh, an accelerating rate calorimeter uh, to force uh, lithium ion, ion cells into thermal runaway. We place the cell within uh, a canister. It is essentially uh, uh, heavy duty pipe nipples with uh, caps screwed onto both ends. Uh, so we enclose the battery within the canister, uh, place it within the uh, arc, heated the arc until the battery went into thermal, rate, thermal runaway and measured pressures and temperatures primarily. So to vary the amount of free space surrounding the cell, we used a variety of, of different sizes of canisters that, sh that are shown in the uh, upper right-hand corner. And the uh, iron phosphate cells we used were, are, are shown in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, we used two, two different size, uh, sizes of cells, one being the 26650 and the other being the 18650. And in this uh, uh, chart here, I'm just listing the combinations of cells and canisters we use for pressure measurements and the amount of free space uh, that was provided for each. So we ran a test with, our, uh, with the battery uh, enclosed within the smallest uh, uh, canister we had. Uh, a particular canister was provided a form fit around an 18650 cell. And uh, when we ran the test, um, the, uh, the, the battery exploded and it, it ruptured the, uh, uh, the canister uh, shown in the picture on the right. Uh, the ruptured canister, canister is shown next to an undamaged canister. And uh, we were quite surprised where uh, we measured uh, about 294 bar of pressure, which equates to about 4,260 uh, PSIA. And uh, that is well over an order of magnitude above the, uh, you know, the 150 PSI criteria that, uh, that MSHA has. And we also tested the uh, cells within uh, the, uh, the various sizes of canisters. And um, as you can see, as uh, the, the size of the enclosure increased, uh, the amount of free space around the cell increased. 
and the measured pressures uh, dropped uh, dramatically. And uh, again, referencing the, the AMSHER criteria of 120, 125 PSI, uh, we're, we're estimating that you need approximately uh, 34 times the, uh, the iron phosphate cell volume of free space uh, to get it down to that 125 PSI threshold. Okay, so there, there are, um, you know, a, a, a few ways that you uh, can uh, mitigate some of these overpressure uh, type situations. Um, you know, if, if you can afford it, you can provide, uh, you know, sufficient free space within your enclosure uh, so that the pressures don't get uh, too high. And uh, with large format batteries, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty common to uh, uh, put uh, BMS and, and, and other uh, uh, precautions in place to uh, prevent a, a cascading uh, type failure. And if you can limit the amount of cells, cells that may uh, fail, um, you limit the amount of gas produced and you can keep the pressures down that way. Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, as far as a pressure relief type situation, um, a, a properly designed and maintained uh, vents with flame resters can provide pressure relief of the ignitions while preventing ignition of a surrounding explosive atmosphere. I'm not aware of a flame arrestor that's uh, specifically designed for lithium ion battery thermal runaway uh, at this point in time, but uh, uh, it's definitely something that I believe uh, should be looked into. Okay, as far as the, uh, the research goes, um, we found an inverse relationship between the thermal run runaway pressure and the amount of free space uh, with these particular iron phosphate cells. Um, and related to that, um, you know, the amount of free space surrounding the cell may be used to predict thermal runaway pressure. And um, looking at the, uh, uh, the relatively large amounts of gas that these cells can produce, uh, the gas liberated, uh, as well as its characteristic temperature rise, is responsible for uh, these high pressures that we're seeing. And just a couple caveats. Um, salts should not be conservative for uh, overcharged cells. Uh, overcharged uh, cells can uh, fail uh, more energetically uh, than uh, lower charged cells. Uh, also, there's some other chemistries out there that may be more reactive uh, than iron phosphate uh, cells. So uh, results may not be conservative, conservative for those chemistries. And, uh, and uh, enclosures with, uh, that may have methane air inside the enclosure uh, could possibly add some more pressure from the methane air ignition. Uh, next steps, um, we want to uh, run a, a series of tests with the iron phosphate cells within the canisters and also have a uh, explosive methane air, con methane air concentrations in the canisters to see uh, to see what kind of impact they may have on the pressures. And we plan to do similar work with uh, NMC cells and uh, the titanate anode LTO cells. The uh, data from today's presentation was uh, published in a paper at, the, uh, uh, at this year's 2020 uh, SME annual meeting. Uh, it's preprint 20-051. And if anybody would like to uh, get a copy of that preprint, pre I would be happy to uh, pass that along. And with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation. If there's any uh, questions or comments, I would be happy to uh, answer them. Tom, ah, thank question. you for that presentation. Oh, go ahead, Dominica. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Jenny. Very limited space in the mining vehicles. Is it still possible to have enough free space inside battery system to prove safety? Right, so uh, for a full size battery, uh, there's, there's no way you're gonna provide 34 times the amount of, uh, of uh, cell in, in free space. So uh, uh, we need to concentrate on uh, trying to prevent the cascade situation. Uh, so we can limit the number of cells that might, that might go into thermal runaway and also uh, 
um, look at the use of uh, vents with flame arresters. This is uh, this is Brian from Artisan. Um, this all all this testing is around these explosion proof uh, enclosures. Are you aware of anyone using these type of batteries in gassy mines? I uh, can't say specifically, but yeah, I'm I'm aware of uh, of some who have uh, uh, applied for um, uh, usage in uh, or approvals, or they're pursuing approvals for use in gassy mines. I think like, like you were saying, there are 34 times the volume of essentially the number of cells that go into thermal runaway, right? And so that's, if you, if you just have one cell go, then theoretically, it could be a reasonable amount of volume. But if you assume that all the cells go, now you're, now you're getting quite large, right? Right. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's relative size between the, uh, the enclosure and the battery. Um, but yeah, um, if we can limit the number of uh, cells that we, you know, that can be foreseeably uh, fail uh, simultaneously or from a com uh, or from a common source, um, I think that would go a long way towards, uh, you know, mitigating the overpressure uh, potential. Very good. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you. Just a quick question, Mrs. Rami. To follow up on the point that Brian was making, uh, so this testing is, you're doing a testing per cell, but do you have, have you developed any parameters to say uh, how much percentage of cell you're going to assume failed at the same time? Uh, as far as the, uh, the number of cells that fail at the same time, uh, as far as uh, uh, taking steps to prevent uh, a cascade failure, uh, you can you, know, you can uh, try to prevent cascade at at the cell level where you may uh, you may have each cell uh, perhaps protected somehow. Uh, cascade prevention could be at the module level where where you may have a number of cells within a module, and um, you know, assume that if uh, if there's a failure, that the cascade would be limited at the module uh, level. Uh, so there, there, right there, there are two potential um, ways of of looking at the uh, cascade prevention. <laughs> 